According to CDC data from 2014, black women are three to four times more likely to experience a pregnancy-related death than white women. Here's how it translates. For every 100,000 live births, on average, 40 black mothers do not survive childbirth versus slightly more than 12 white mothers. Over the last decade, these rates have steadily increased. Studies show that maternal mortality rates are consistently higher for black women, even when income, education, and other socioeconomic factors are controlled for. Welcome to Advancing Health, a podcast brought to you by the American Hospital Association. I'm Tom Hederly, senior writer at AHA and your podcast host. Maternal health is a top priority for AHA. Through its Institute for Diversity and Health Equity, the AHA continues to advance health equity and eliminate disparities, including in the area of maternal health. Specifically, we're encouraging hospitals and health systems to take three steps. Stratify your data by race, partner with community stakeholders, and address possible unconscious and implicit bias. In this Advancing Health podcast, Jay Bott, AHA Senior Vice President and Chief Medical Officer, speaks with a leading expert about what more can be done. Dr. Sharmila Makija chairs the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology and Women's Health at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and Montefiore Medical Center in the Bronx, New York. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the American Hospital Association Advancing Health in America podcast channel, and we're so grateful to have our guest with us today, Dr. Sharmila Makija, who's the chair of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology and Women's Health, professor of gynecologic oncology, and the Chella and Moise Safra Endowed Chair at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and Montefiore Medical Center located in the Bronx, New York. So under Dr. Makija's leadership in 2017, Montefiore Medical Center delivered almost 6,000 babies, among the highest number of births for hospitals in New York State. Welcome to the show, Dr. Makija, and thank you for joining us to share your perspective on this critically important issue of maternal health. Thank you so much, Dr. Bopp, for including us in your podcast to talk about this very important and concerning issue that we see all throughout the U.S. that we really, truly need to have a conversation about. So thank you. Well, thanks for joining us, and let's jump right into it. So knowing that maternal health has been your life's work, would you share a patient story that illustrates the importance of this work from your experiences at Montefiore Medical Center or elsewhere? So, you know, we started to observe maternal deaths rise in the United States around 1990. And by the early 2000s, maternal death rates more than doubled. The CDC now estimates that almost 1,000 new and expectant mothers will die in the U.S. each year. An additional 500,000 women will experience a life-threatening postpartum complication called severe maternal morbidity or near misses, and that these near misses are considered the precursor to monitoring maternal deaths. And what is known is that more than half of these deaths and near misses are preventable. So I commend the American Hospital Association for shining a light on this rising rate of U.S. maternal deaths. It's a difficult, though crucial, conversation we really need to have The most common causes of maternal deaths are hemorrhage, hypertension, and pulmonary embolism. All have established management guidelines, and risk factors such as unintended pregnancy and access to care are often cited as areas of coordinated improvement plans. At many maternity centers, including those here at Montefiore, our care teams practice guidelines as urgent scenarios and specially designed simulation skill centers. Yet despite our best efforts, maternal deaths and near misses continue to increase at an alarming rate. And unfortunately, we have experienced one too many patient stories that reflect this problem, each significantly devastating with their impact, not only on their families, but our communities as well. There is one particular patient story that brought an acute awareness and changed the way we addressed our maternal health care problem in our institution. Our patient actually survived a pulmonary embolism, which is a blood clot that goes to your lungs, and typically most patients don't survive. Interestingly, this is what Serena Williams, arguably the world's greatest tennis player, experienced and survived after she delivered her baby last year. Our normal review process would have been limited as the patient did well because our team responded and treated the patient quite quickly. 
However, there were arguments amongst all the team members, including the doctors, nurses, anesthesiologists, and residents. And that's where I had to step in because there was finger pointing and blaming of each other as to why the diagnosis was delayed, even though the outcome was good and nothing would have triggered a full review. I asked the malpractice attorney to conduct an unbiased full chart review and then allowed him to lead the discussion with all of the team members present. And the outcome was incredibly enlightening. In the end, there was a clear systems issue with a lack of support to promote honest feedback and improvement plans and a lack of trust amongst the team members. And that was really our starting point to build a high, reliable organization, which we will discuss a a bit later in depth. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that. And I know that what I see as important elements of what you talked about include coordination of care, team-based care, simulations of practice so that when those crisis situations might arise, teams know exactly how to handle it. And then this piece related to looking at the data and evaluating it and then taking action that reflects improvement based on the data. So thanks for your leadership on that. As we think of system-level opportunities to promote the health of mothers and babies, what are some key administrative considerations that hospital executive teams and boards should know about in addressing maternal health for high-risk patient populations? You know, I feel that we need to be honest and aware of our own statistics in our community. You know, it's very important to know what's happening in the U.S., But to really understand what's happening in our own backyard and our communities that we're serving is vital into creating better plans of care. And this sometimes can frankly make many leaders uncomfortable. There's a feeling of guilt or feeling that we're not doing enough because the problems aren't getting fixed so quickly. So I think just being able to address the problems very directly and transparently are the first start in solving a problem. And it includes the demographics of the community we serve, as well as the health and social issues they have in order to thoughtfully address the problems. In other words, targeting the treatment that we deliver. Our particular hospital leadership patient safety team reviewed our Department of Health statistics. And, you know, this is what we saw in the U.S. and compared what we saw in the Bronx in order to start that problem solving. And when we talk about maternal mortality, that's defined as the number of deaths per 100,000 live births and the severe maternal morbidities or near misses are per 10,000 live births. So the numbers I give just so you know what the, the denominator is. In particular, when we looked at 2013 data when we first started to address this, we saw in the U.S. that the mortality had increased from 12 to about 18 per 100,000 live births. And the near misses nearly doubled from 74 to about 130 per 10,000 live births. In the Bronx, when we compared at that same time period for both mortality and the near misses, we saw almost a rate of doubling that of the U.S. So in mortality in the Bronx, it was 26 per 100,000 live births, and the near misses almost 300 per 10,000 live births. So that was quite concerning, and that is where we started to delve into the demographics. You know, some of the possible reasons for the increase and for a patient to be considered high risk are having a chronic health condition, the level of facility care that they're receiving care from, and their social conditions. So if we look at these particular areas of high risk factors in our community, we felt that we could perhaps better target our care plans for patients. So when we looked at chronic health, which includes chronic hypertension, diabetes, pregnancy-induced hypertension or high blood pressure, sickle cell anemia, when we compared those stats from the U.S. and in the Bronx, we had anywhere from two to three times the rate when compared to the U.S. So we knew those were the particular areas that looking at that we needed to really focus on our care plans. Then looking at the facility that we serve in, we actually work out of what's considered or labeled as a level four which is the highest level you can have, and it's also called a regional perinatal center. So we're better equipped to handle the more complicated cases because we have more teams that can address all the various issues. And being a regional perinatal center means that other hospitals that are conducting prenatal care outside of our institution are able to transfer their sickest patients to us to take care of. So we have a higher volume of 
sicker patients rather than the low risk, so the more of the high-risk patients. Then when we looked at the social aspects that are related to creating a more high-risk factor for patients, having a black race, low literacy rate, living below the 10% federal poverty level, and a body mass index or BMI greater than 30 all contribute to being high-risk factors for maternal care. And we saw in the Bronx that across the board for these four particular ones, that was 30% of our population had one of those. And in addition to the fact that we have a very diverse immigrant population, which includes a difference in culture that affects food and nutrition, when you discuss pregnancy prior to viability, limited prenatal care and late access to care, those were the three areas that we really started to focus our plans uh, of care. So we looked at the whole spectrum of care. You know, most often hospitals look at what's happening right on labor and delivery, and that's what we would consider intrapartum, and that's where a lot of the efforts have been focused on. But we looked at this, that when we look at the social issues and we look at our facility and the chronic conditions, we really started to plan it out as pre-pregnancy, prenatal, intrapartum, and then postpartum, and then directed and, and formed our care plans around those areas that we could perhaps make an impact. So with regard to pre-pregnancy, we started to manage, and again, this seems very basic, but it's really focusing our efforts to make a concerted effort with our team. So we looked at managing obesity-related issues, which comprise of diabetes and high blood pressure, family planning access, which normally you would think of that as after pregnancy, but really having this discussion before they get pregnant, because we do know that statistically, 50% of all pregnancies are considered unplanned. So those women that may have chronic conditions that may not have wanted to get pregnant, we felt strongly that we needed to start that counseling ahead of time before they got pregnant just to give them options for counseling. And then there's also the preconception counseling with our fertility program, again, addressing any chronic conditions they may have as they try to get pregnant. Then we moved over into the category of prenatal care. So they are pregnant, and we really focused with cardiology of having a joint clinic because with the rising rates of hypertension that's uncontrolled, we're starting to see more and more patients that were pregnant with cardiomyopathies or conditions affecting their heart, and it's concerning because of the impact a pregnancy has on the heart we wanted to make sure we we're working very closely in a proactive way with the cardiology team of having joint clinics so that when women came in to deliver, there were plans that were already set and the teams were already aware of what that plan was so that they weren't reacting to an issue but proactively knew how to manage this patient. Then again, with the intrapartum or those activities happening on labor and delivery, and as I mentioned, where most hospital efforts have occurred, this includes the team steps, communication skills, simulation programs, which focused on practicing in centers, the more common scenarios, such as what to do in the event of hemorrhage or massive bleeding, so that they're practicing these skills. Um, and then really looking at the Safe Motherhood Initiative, which was initiated in 2013, again with ACOG, and that focused on implementing bundle protocols for the three most common scenarios of uh, complications that we saw, which are hemorrhage, high blood pressure, and pulmonary embolism. And then finally, circling back to the postpartum, which has, in the past, has not necessarily been a focus of attention because, you know, more often than not, even though we're talking about maternal mortality and near misses, more often than not, patients actually did well, and the thought was, okay, they've made it through their pregnancy, they have a healthy baby, we'll get them home, and we were missing that opportunity of having a conversation while they were in the hospital, and again, focusing what their treatment needs or what their needs were in the outpatient setting. So one of the areas is that we've circled back to family planning to have that discussion while we have them in the hospital and any other needs, any uh, social needs they may have as well. So that was the whole spectrum of care for a patient of 
pre-pregnancy, prenatal, interpartum, and postpartum. And so clearly we were focused on targeting the patient care plans. However, I do want to mention something that we've done at Montefiore that is a little bit unusual in that in order to address how our care teams were working together, you know, we talked about that there was there needed to be trust built and support and, and to develop that and to prevent burnout proactively, we recently hired a psychiatrist for our care team that will be actively working and rounding on labor and delivery. And our thought was that if our care team is supported, they in turn should be able to provide better care for patients. That's excellent. Thanks for sharing your key actions and insights. I think this piece of the relationship between behavioral health and the care that expectant mothers and new mothers need is really important. And I think one of the other pieces I heard was really having leadership and boards keep this issue at the front of their strategic agenda and review and looking at that data at a regular clip. One of the areas we focus on in our initiative, Better Health for Mothers and Babies, is examining disparities. And as you alluded to, there are some high-risk situations and there are populations that are disproportionately affected by this issue. So when we think about disparities, what are some of the reasons why they exist in maternal health and really particularly amongst black women? Yes. You know, as you know, African-American women are three to four times more likely to die during or after delivery than our white women. And according to the World Health Organization, or WHO, their odds of surviving childbirth are comparable to those of women in low-resource countries. And we're talking about the U.S., where we have resources. And so this is of great concern as to why are we seeing a rise in maternal mortality, but clearly a disparity where it's even higher for black women. We do know that preeclampsia or having hypertension or even eclampsia, which is having the hypertension with seizures, are about 50% more common in black women than in white women, and they often are more severe in nature. In addition to that, we do know that social conditions like poor housing and air quality and nutrition are also more likely to affect black women more than non-black women, including Latinas and whites. And although older mothers generally have greater educational or economic resources to access health care, black mothers in their mid to late 30s have five times the mortality rate of black teen mothers. So clearly we have to improve our understanding and awareness regarding the risks for black women and, again, proactively address solutions that are directed towards black women rather than applying solutions that work for white women. So being more aware that if they do have the early signs of preeclampsia or the conditions that make them high risk, being more diligent and perhaps even seeing these patients more often because they have more severe symptoms. So one of the areas that comes up in the conversation about disparities and the impact of this issue on black women is unconscious implicit bias. And so how do you see unconscious implicit bias affecting maternal health outcomes And more importantly, what should hospitals and clinicians do to identify and address these biases? Yes, this is a very important topic when we're dealing with any type of medical decision making. And so this particular topic has been brought up when we're addressing perhaps even the issues of why there's a disparity with the rates of maternal mortality for black women. So if we start off by trying to understand what implicit biases, then perhaps we can address how to improve it. So implicit biases are really a form of bias that refer to the way you mentally process perception and memory, your judgment and reasoning, and it's also known as cognitive biases. So these type of biases happen because our human decision-making processes are just not just factual based, but they can be rather influenced by a variety of factors, and some of these include how we process information through shortcuts. And this could be where we might use our intuition or common sense based on what we think we know. It could include motivational or emotional factors from our own personal experiences, and then social influences, the media and stereotypes that we hear about. So all of these, this essentially includes the media and the education conversations that we're exposed to but may not be consciously aware of. 
And the assumption is that these implicit biases do in fact contribute to our decision-making in medicine. And, and we really do need to recognize and acknowledge our biases and find ways to lessen their impact on how we make medical decisions. And like I mentioned before, this could be very well one of the reasons for the difference in mortality rates we're seeing for groups of patients, including black women. And, you know, you're asking the easy question, how do we reduce this? How do we improve and eliminate even implicit biases? Some of the ways that we're trying to address it is looking at how do you discount commonly held stereotypes to be actively talking about that it's not that we're intentionally trying to be stereotyping people or patients, but are we aware of what we are doing because of what we've been exposed to in the past and it's just inherent in how we process things? Using context, changing the context of the situation to influence our responses, using motivation to change responses, but really encouraging people to take and our providers to take the responsibility for their implicit biases and being aware is the first real step and then actively managing the context seems to be the most effective way that we've seen how to start addressing it. It's not simple because, again, there is a reflex of defensiveness of I'm not biased, I'm really not. And I truly believe that we're not. It's just what we've been exposed to in the past is influencing how we're making our decisions. So being aware and putting it in context seems to be the first step in in addressing it. Thank you. Absolutely. It's a complex issue. And I think that awareness and having the conversation so that teams can make different decisions and be consistent in the context that you speak of is important. I know that some organizations are using the Patient and Family Advisory Committee are convening their community of black mothers to have the conversation so that clinical teams are learning from them as well. I mean, I think the voice of mothers and families are so important in this work so we deliver the best care we can. So when we think about the role of hospitals and health systems in this issue, and given your experience, what do you think the healthcare delivery system should do more of to address maternal mortality and reduce morbidity? And and specifically, you know, our hospitals and health systems who are redefining what they mean for communities and how they look and how they deliver services. You know, I think that throughout every hospital system, the intention is always good. I always believe that. And, you know, we've been hearing more and more about patient safety and the focus on patient safety. And it's rightfully so. We, we've seen the statistics of not only just in maternal health care in other areas where we're seeing issues around patient safety. So, My concern, though, is that we're using the label of patient safety at times as just a catch-all to promote short-term initiatives that perhaps may not make an impact. And I, I feel pretty strongly that patient safety plans need to be thoughtfully planned out and constantly reviewed and improved to be effective. And so when we look at patient safety models, I think of them as being three tiers, really from a basic to complex with an increasing impact on lowering or decreasing mortality rates for any safety concern. So this is not just in maternal health care, but looking at how do we address all patient safety issues throughout the system. And in most improvement plans, we have to start with forming a strong foundation and then build upon that foundation because you can't just start with the big pieces and not have anything for it to land on and continue to grow from. And it does take a substantial amount of time and effort to do that. And because of that, many programs focus on the basic foundation and then stop there. And in my humble opinion, the lack of advancing safety models of care contributes to the reason why we haven't seen a trend in improvement, specifically for maternal mortality rates. So if we look at these tiers that have been published in many journals, including the Harvard Business Review, we see when we look at the first tier, that this includes the category of technical advancements. So improving surgical techniques, creating new and developing new medical treatments, even providing focused training. And this is where I would put the simulation skill centers, the practice centers fall in this category. So keep practicing, perfect practice makes perfect. You're practicing, you're improving 
something that's technical. Then going on to the second tier, this is now where we're standardizing procedures. And, and this is what we hear nowadays, right? The checklist that we hear about, what the pilots do, measuring and reporting how compliant we are with the checklist, the measurement and feedback on quality metrics. That whole piece is the standardization. And I do think that these first two tiers are critical to building that strong foundation. I would actually argue that the third tier is where our concerted efforts should really be focused on. And the third tier is what we call the high reliability organizing. And it's the most complex as it requires addressing behavioral changes. And because unlike a plane, patients are more complex. There's an interplay of social and physical issues that contribute to an illness in addition to the provider's own behavior and biases, right? And so being aware of how our frontline practices and behaviors are organized and assessed and reviewed and improved upon is critical. Providing that leadership support for responding and, and learning from the errors and truly learning from it and being open and honest about it and it is a cultural shift, right, towards teamwork and care coordination in real time and actively managing that. And for me, fundamentally, it's about communication and the expectation that the team coordinates their attention and action to continually improve in patient care. Using the protocols as a basis, but continually, you know, it can't be just a checklist and then you can just leave. You have to be able to look at what's really happening. Okay, we've done the checklist. What's happening now? The patient's still not doing well. It can't be just a checklist. It has to be all of the pieces. And allowing, you know, the tenets of a high reliable organization is truly having a preoccupation with failing and really embracing that you're going to fail and learning from it and rectifying it quickly. In addition, a reluctance to oversimplifying things. You know, this bad outcome happened, therefore we conclude the doctor nurse must not know how to take care of this particular disease, so we'll make them relearn the information and practice the skills, where we may actually have to delve deeper to examine the behavioral issues that come to play within the teams themselves. So I feel that we need care delivery models really designed to provide consistent, high, reliable maternity care in this particular instance, and these high, reliable healthcare models truly incorporate fundamental expectations such as understanding failures to create better standards of practice and transparency to improve communication. And in order to really achieve this high, reliable maternity care that makes an impact across the U.S., that will require an engagement across the whole healthcare delivery system. That includes the government, non-for-profits, insurance companies, hospitals, and healthcare providers. And, you know, I have to say at Montefiore, we have restructured our care teams. It's still a work in progress. It's never going to be a one and done. It's a constant improvement process. And we are providing better communication plans on our labor and delivery units in an effort to actually improve and drive us towards this high, reliable, safe maternal levy care that we, we truly need to provide for our patients. I really believe in this notion of high reliability, and so it's wonderful that you've shared that with uh, our audience. And I think that, you know, in some cases, the notion that standardization can be innovation works too, and that the partnership between administrative and clinical teams is so important in this effort. And then the relationship with primary care and community stakeholders, as well as mothers and families. So let's talk about some of these bright spots. You talked about high reliability organizations as, as one approach. What are some other bright spots you're seeing that the field can learn from? And then particularly those bright spots related to the engagement of mothers and families as well. That's right. You know, we often forget we get into our mode of taking care of a patient or what the needs are that we think are the needs of the medical pieces. But Again, going back to the basics of communicating and learning from our patients and what their needs are. They may have more social needs. They may feel actually just terrified of coming into a very busy, loud hospital, and it makes them nervous. They, they thought everything was okay, and now they're coming into a very active situation. So really understanding what a patient needs and wants are 
again, I think is a basic tenet of care. However, we're also learning that there's a, we have to be more open to learning and working with all healthcare providers, right? And the care spectrum isn't just about the doctors and nurses. When, when it comes to maternal care, you know, we have midwives and doulas who all contribute to providing care. And that's really because not all women need a high-risk doctor. And we have to be aware to understand the risk factors each woman may have and then triage their care to include providers that can provide both low-risk maternal care and then have the ability in a safe, inviting way to transfer them to our high-risk facilities if needed. And so I think it's important to know if we've assessed that a patient is low-risk, why are we not utilizing, you know, midwives and doulas in the communities? Because working with midwives and doulas to at least provide some access to care it is important. And all of our programs and efforts that we've talked about before to improve maternal care are truly futile if, if women can't even access care and from rural counties and rural areas. You know, I, I presently serve on, as a board member for the non-for-profit Every Mother Counts. And their mission is to improve consistent access to safe, respectful maternity care for every mother everywhere. And I feel very strongly about working together with them because we're redefining and truly raising the standard maternity care expectations because our women and families do deserve far better than what what we're delivering right now. You've hit on some um, real important considerations. One of the other things I've seen the field think about is the restructuring of the postpartum care pathway. And so thinking about a a redesign so that there are visits at week three and 12, uh, looking at a six-month visit with women with complications and using both telehealth and community health workers to help support some of those practices. And then thinking about weight gain and weight loss and other behavioral health conditions because the postpartum depression piece uh, is important and, and May is mental health month. And so organizations are thinking about how to address that effectively and seeing some real opportunities there with team-based care as well as using virtual and digital technology. So what is Montefiore's plans for future work in this area? So some of the future plans, in addition to what I had previously mentioned, looking at the entire spectrum of care for a woman, you brought up mental health and postpartum depression Again, when we were looking at the postpartum rounding in the hospital and follow-up during what we call the fourth trimester, this has been an area that we've really focused on providing more access to care. Now, you know, what we say is access to care is having a patient come into the office. But as you know, sometimes, especially if they've had a newborn or they have more than one child at home and working, it's very hard for them to be able to come back and forth to our outpatient clinics. In addition to taking the opportunity and the advantage of while we have a patient in the hospital or even one visit in the outpatient setting, we are now looking at utilizing and working with one particular company with using an app and having a patient be able to communicate with us. And really, our area is looking at mental health and depression in particular and allowing a woman to be able to talk to us when they need to through the app where we are able to better serve her needs when she needs it. And having that ability to really broaden our impact and touch points for a patient is really important to us. So that's one area that we've been exploring that we've piloted and have some preliminary results that we're working through to present at the next national meeting. But I think that's an important area where we can, again, address the poor access to care in a very important area of depression for women. Excellent. Well, we really appreciate uh, your leadership and that of Montefiore on this issue. And one of the other things I recently saw in the vital signs report that the CDC released this month was related to the issue of cardiomyopathy in the postpartum period. Any uh, perspective on why that's such a significant percentage of pregnancy-related deaths and and what we might be able to do about it? We have saw that same increase happening over the past couple of years. And as I just briefly mentioned, we have a joint cardiology program, clinical program, where we see patients together. Our high-risk doctors, our maternal fetal medicine doctors, see patients with the cardiologist 
to form plans of care because the complications from being pregnant with cardiomyopathy increase during the time of delivery where there's more pressure and there's change in fluid dynamics, you know, all of those pieces. The reason for the increase could be just still related to the increase that we see in chronic conditions for people throughout the country, you know, pre-pregnancy. So the obesity rates and hypertension rates are on the rise. And the thought is that that's all contributing to the cardiomyopathy that we're seeing more and more for women. So we are now looking at these risk factors and saying if a woman is, you know, has a high body mass index, has hypertension, we're, again, being more proactive of assessing if they have cardiomyopathy, if if it's not known, what are they at risk for, for developing cardiomyopathy, and then creating the plans in the event it develops or they have it, and then how to manage them at the time of delivery. So uh, I do think it's the incidence of chronic conditions that are on the rise in the U.S. in general that are contributing to that. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I think we're seeing sort of chronic conditions be an important contributor here and organizations working to redesign some of the care pathways to support mothers with chronic conditions, both in the prenatal period during pregnancy and in the fourth trimester. Earlier this year, we released an advisory for our initiative, Better Health for Mothers and Babies Taking Action Saving Lives. And one of the action areas there was related to examining disparities and acting on that data. And so our AHA Institute for Diversity and Health Equity has been engaged on that front, uh, including the issues of the next level of cultural competency training, which includes unconscious and implicit bias. From your view, how can the AHA's Institute for Diversity and Health Equity continue to be a good partner in this effort and help turn the tide on uh, health inequities that mothers may face? I think that's a wonderful partner to have. And what the AHA is doing with this institute, and, and the first is always about the awareness, right? Bringing in awareness that this is an issue and to try to lessen the defensiveness of blame and to really work together and sharing the knowledge and being open about the failures of what's worked, what hasn't worked, you know, what may work for us at Montefiore may not work at the hospital, even just down the street, because our cultures may be different. Our communities that we directly serve may be slightly different, but sharing that knowledge of what has worked that may work for someone else another institution, I think only improves our health and well-being for our communities across the board. So I think taking this model of understanding implicit biases and how do we improve on how we make decisions, taking the high reliable organization and applying that and, and helping support hospitals in developing those different types of cultures and the HROs across the board so that they're not actually having the same problems that we did, they can get past that and actually start at a higher level. I think in the end, just sharing that knowledge very openly and supporting each other is really the best way to improving care across the U.S. and our communities. Thank you. I think that you raised some important points here around you know, this notion that we can't achieve quality without equity of care. And so high reliability organizations is so critical to that effort. And the notion of awareness and strengthening community partnerships, not just for the moment, but for the long haul, because that's what's going to be needed. And working with the perinatal collaboratives and the public health departments and mothers and families. And and we really have been grateful to be a founding partner with the Alliance for Innovation and Maternal Health and continue to work so closely with AIM and, and their partners. And so your point also about the contextual implementation of practices is critical because the culture of the environment may have implications for that implementation, but I think that the principles and the approach can be very much the same. Dr. Makija, thanks for joining us on our AHA podcast channel, Advancing Health in America. We really appreciate your leadership, your insights in the conversation on this really important issue that we are together working to advance and appreciate the work of Montefiore. Thank you, Dr. Bott. And to all of you, thank you again for listening to this podcast in our Better Health for Mothers and Babies series. To share your success stories and best practices in maternal health, please email bhmb at aha.org. 
And to learn more about what America's hospitals and health systems are doing to improve the health of mothers and babies, please visit www.aha.org forward slash better dash health dash four dash mothers dash and dash babies. Have a good one, everyone.